well, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dan, who's uh, yeah, working at Caltech with uh, Chris Ivata and also with Marco Mikowski. Some things which I completely don't understand, and the stuff he's not so going to talk about, I hope I can understand a bit. And um, the important thing is that he's going to be here until Monday, and he's also applying for a CETA postdoc here, so uh, if you have questions for him and want to talk to him, it's, it's probably very good to uh, hammer him afterwards. And um, uh, we are going to take him out for dinner tonight as well, so I will drop the email later. So, please. Well, thanks, Jens, for uh, having me to give this seminar. Um, I'm going to tell you about work I've been doing with Chris Hirata on cosmological hydrogen recombination, uh, and in particular, two physical effects, very high, highly excited uh, Rydberg states and uh, a class of forbidden transitions that no one's bothered putting into the calculation just yet. So the motivation for this work um, is sort of twofold. Uh, one is to make accurate predictions for CMB anisotropies in light of the recent Planck launch. And the other is to try to begin to make predictions of the spectra from recombination, the photons produced by the recombination uh, epoch. And this is something uh, Jens has worked uh, extensively on. Um, so I'm going to start by going through the physics of recombination in a nutshell and tell you what goes wrong with the simple, uh, both the simple Peebles picture from the 60s and then the multi-level atom calculation that was used for the WMAP data analysis. And I'll tell you about a new tool we've developed to solve this problem. Uh, including these very high-end states. And then I'll also tell you about the relevant forbidden transitions. Uh, then I will plop up some nice results and try to instill some intuition for the shapes of some curves. And, and then I'll tell you about uh, what I'm still up to and what I hope to do uh, on this problem in the future. So the great motivator for a lot of this work is the fact that the Planck satellite has been launched. It's at L2, and uh, it's taking data. There are even partial sky maps. Um, and the real hope is that Planck is going to make something like cosmic variance uh, limited measurements of the CMB temperature and E-mode polarization anisotropies to angular scales of L of 2,500 and 1,500, uh, respectively. And the motivation here is that people have done a variety of Monte Carlo simulations. And this is really a redshift dependent statement, but the claim is that we want to predict the free electron fraction with somewhere between a few parts in 10 to the 4 and a few parts in 10 to the 3 accuracy in order to accurately make predictions of the CMB multiple moments for Planck. So just to put um, a little bit uh, more behind that statement, one of the things people are hoping to measure from Planck are the properties of the primordial density power spectrum. And so this um, is often characterized by an amplitude, some scalar amplitude, and a slope for the power spectrum. So these likelihood plots are from a paper by uh, Doug, uh, Doug Scott and Wang and Moss. And so what they've done here is they've taken some fiducial set of cosmological parameters, analyzed the data, including some bit of recombination physics, in this case, um, higher two-photon transitions and some helium physics. And they've shown how the likelihood contours shift over when you don't include the relevant bit of atomic physics in your data analysis. And so we can see that at least in principle, if we get recombination wrong, our measurements of these primordial numbers, the um, baryon density, the properties of the power spectrum, and even the optical depth between us and the surface of last scattering could be off. And the reason this happens is that a lot of the leverage on these quantities um, from Planck comes from the highest angular momentum scale, uh, sorry, the highest angular, the smallest angular scales, high L. And this is exactly where the details of recombination start to matter. And some of these numbers, N sub S, for example, can be related to the slow roll parameters of standard um, um, single field inflationary theory. And so if, we, if, we, if these measurements are off, inferences about the high energy physics of inflation from cosmological, uh, from, from CMB, uh, could be off. And so sort of the lesson is that this high energy physics comes to us through a electron volt atomic physics filter. And we need to do that right in order to get 10 to the question mark GEV physics right. In other words, the unknown physics of inflation. And even if you don't like inflation, um, inferences about the cosmic reionization history through our measurements of the optical depth between us and the surface of last scattering could also be off, not as dramatically. Um, if we do the recombination problem incorrectly. So what are the physical effects here? Well, the CMB comes to us from the epoch when photons kinetically decouple from electrons. So that's sort of described by this reaction, and it's sensible to think uh, 
that the electron density is going to be intimately connected to the properties of the CMB, and that in turn is influenced by the recombination problem. In terms of all the acoustic mode equations, the Boltzmann hierarchy that you run any time you see those CMB C sub Ls, this guy shows up all over the place. This is the um, probability that a photon last scattered at some redshift z, and so this depends on the electron density, and that's going to shift over CMB peaks, change their amplitudes. There are a few simple ways that the free electron um, fraction changes the gross properties of the CMB anisotropies. One is that we rescatter primary ani uh, we rescatter the primary anisotropies of the CMB off of free electrons left over from recombination, the frozen out electrons along the line of sight. And that suppresses the C sub Ls at the smallest of scales. So just to give you uh, a picture for what's going on there, we have some CMB hotspot. We have photons coming to us from the surface of last scattering. Here we have some leftover electrons from recombination. And then these get scattered out of the line of sight, making the spot a little bit colder. And so that's the physics there. Uh, one of the other... Um, Uh, one of the other physical effects here is that there's a high L damping in the CMB anisotropies. This is so-called silk damping, and that picks up at the length scale of a random walk of a photon as it Thomson scatters off of electrons. And again, that length scale, scale is related to the free electron density. Finally, uh, from the viewpoint of CMB anisotropies, the polarization of the CMB can't come from a monopole or a dipole at the surface of last scattering. Uh, and if we just think about two unpolarized um, photons, two polarized uh, photon streams coming towards an electron and scattering out in this direction, we can sort of geometrically see that unpolarized light in uh, leads to unpolarized light out. But if we do have a quadrupole moment in the incoming radiation field, we can produce a polarization from an unpolarized field. So how does this connect to recombination? The point is that um, when, when the fluid is t uh, completely ionized and tightly coupled, we don't have quadrupoles and higher moments in the radiation field. So the length of the recombination epoch is crucial because first you have to pick up a quadrupole um, and that requires the plasma to be in the epoch when it's becoming more neutral. And then you need to rescatter that quadrupole to produce a polarization. And then moving from CMB anisotropies um, to the spectrum of the CMB, it's thought that the recombination epoch, this very nice uh, plot is from one of uh, Jens's papers, one of Jens's, Jens's review papers on the topic. Um, these spectral distortions come to us from the um, epoch of recombination. These are sort of um, all the bound-bound transitions from the epoch of, of recombination. And this is, this is, at least on the face of it, a tiny signal suppressed by you know, a factor of a million or 10 million relative to the overall CMB spectrum. But there is some hope uh, that that could be detected someday. Um, you know, how realistic that is sort of seems to depend on who you ask. But this would be really neat because it would be a direct probe of our knowledge of recombination physics, um, you know, unfiltered through this whole Boltzmann hierarchy of anisotropies. It'd be a, a global homogeneous signal across the whole sky, and it would be uh, a fantastic thing to detect it. Um, the simplest sort of physical picture you might hope to have for recombination is just one where you assume that this reaction N just denotes an excited state of hydrogen, so we have the higher hierarchy of states. We could just write down the Saha equation. And when we do that, that tells us that the free electron fraction falls to about a half when the temperature is around 0.3 EV, or around the redshift of 1300. Uh, that's great, but all the subsequent evolution can't be described by Saha equilibrium because all of the relevant rates sort of shoved into this parameter here are less than the Hubble parameter starting at a temperature just a little bit below this. So you actually have to go solve the coupled rate problem to do the recombination problem correctly. Okay, here we go. Um, so there are bottlenecks to, this overall, to the overall physics of recombination. Uh, the first bottleneck is that if you recombine to the ground state, the photon you produce is going to ionize its neighbor at a very fast rate relative to the expansion time scale of the universe. And so ground state recombinations are totally ineffective. So the next thing we want to do is we want to consider um, decays, uh, recombinations to excited states. But if we find ourselves in an L equals one state, we're going to very rapidly uh, decay to the ground state. But again, that photon is going to re-excite its neighbor very quickly. So we get trapped in these resonances, which are excited states that are pretty easily ionized, and so that slows down recombination. 
the key realization of uh, both Peebles and, and Sunyaev was that we can escape from these bottlenecks, off any resonant bottleneck, through essentially two physical processes. One is a two-photon decay, which takes this energy and smears it over a continuum, so we don't resonantly, resonantly re-excite things. And the other thing we have working for us is the expansion of the universe. If we're sitting ever so slightly redward of line center, the Hubble expansion is going to shift us off line center, uh, and some fraction of those photons are actually going to escape. So in the Peebles recombination story, or the, the Sunyaev recombination story, the overall recombination rate is given by something like this expression, where this term here just tells us a recombination, temperature-dependent recombination rate to some state, and it's a two-body process, so there's our free electron abundance squared. And then we just have photoionizations out of that state with some phase space factor that relates the ionization and, and uh, recombination rates. But none of that included the bit of physics I just told you about, these bottlenecks and these escape routes. So that sits here. And in the simplest picture, when n equals 2 is the bottleneck, we can actually work out what that suppression factor is. It's given by this expression. So first of all, we have the Hubble redshifting term that tells us how quickly uh, we're able to recombine by escaping off resonance. Then we have this 2s to 1s, 2 photon um, decay rate. And finally, we have this ionization term. So all this term does is it um, parameterizes the efficiency of recombination. This is sort of the sum total of things that can happen to an atom that's trying to recombine if we're just including this n equals 2 bottleneck. And this tells us uh, how efficiently we recombine. So this two fo it turns out that if you compare the ratio of these two processes, the two photon process actually dominates until the latest of times, until uh, redshifts less than 850. Uh, so if you're ever teaching a quantum mechanics class and your students uh, are being lazy and don't want to learn about forbidden transitions, you should just tell them that half the atoms in the universe form through forbidden transitions. So this simple Peebles uh, uh, Sunyaev three-level atom picture was the state of the art for 30 years, and that's shown by this figure here. And we can see just how badly Saha equilibrium fails. And we can get some intuition for the dependence of things on cosmological parameters. As we drive the overall matter density up, the Hubble expansion is faster, and so things freeze out earlier, and we're left with more free electrons at late times. Whereas if we drive the baryon density up, um, recombination is more efficient and faster, and so we're left with fewer electrons at free times, at late times. But these models from the 60s made three key physical assumptions that break down at a level that's actually going to be important for Planck data analysis. The first is that they assume that the populations of the different angular momentum substates of the hydrogen atom are just equal to the total population of a shell multiplied by this factor. In other words, they assume perfect statistical equilibrium between the different angular momentum substates. The other thing Peebles and Sunya have assumed was that the, the, um, the excited states are related to the ground state population just using a standard Boltzmann thermal equilibrium factor. Both of these assumptions break because essentially none of the relevant rates can keep up as the universe cools and becomes really diffuse. And the other thing assumed there is that the matter and the photon temperatures are the same. And there the approximation is that um, the uh, Thomson, uh, sorry, this inequality is backwards, but that the Thomson equilibration rate is much faster than the Hubble time. But that also breaks down at late times. So, Sort of the first refinement to this picture um, was Seeger, Scott, and Sasilov, who did a multi-level atom calculation in the year 2000. And then there's this RecFast code, which takes the Peebles calculation and corrects it with the fudge factor to reproduce this. So this is what sits inside CMB fast. And any time you see plots of C sub L's and the beautiful line going through all the points in W map, this is the code that was run. And in that calculation, they broke these two assumptions, the assumption of radiative equilibrium between different end states and this assumption of perfect equilibrium between matter and radiation. And you know, there's a zoo of 50 other effects they included, uh, which you don't need to know about today. Um, so the question is, what happens when we start to follow these different angular momentum substates separately? So I believe, uh, I believe Jens was the first person to do this calculation. Uh, at least in the cosmological context. People have thought about interstellar emission nebulae and things like that. So in this calculation, they follow the different L and N substates separately. And they're able, they were able to get to, I don't know, maybe 120. Uh, you were able to push it to 120. And the thing is that at least sort of 
So there's some subtlety with the statistical significance of these things, but if you just look at the corrections at Nmax of 100, you're still seeing something like, you know, at least in the 2005 paper, there was a 0.1% correction. So this was the motivation for us to attack this problem and try to find out how high in N we have to go for the recombination history to converge accurately enough for Planck data analysis. And we can get some sense for how this uh, resolution effect is going to change things qualitatively. Because of the dipole selection rules, uh, we can only uh, move an angular momentum space with L of plus or minus one. We're gonna have atoms in highly excited states that get stuck. And so that's gonna slow down recombination. But because we have to keep track of all these different states, the problem gets hard. On sort of your standard uh, workstation, it takes six months um, to uh, do the calculation for Nmax of 300 using the old codes. So the question was, well, there's sort of two, two ways to approach that. One is, okay, let's go get, you know, a 100 core machine and just throw a truck at it. Um, but the thing is, we wanna turn knobs, we wanna make sure we got all the physics right, we wanna calibrate things for parameter estimation. So we wanted to think of a, of a way to solve this problem tractably on, yeah? I just want to recall, quadrupolar magnetic level density would be down in rate by what, effective alpha? That's right, yeah. So that isn't obviously small compared to the 0.1%. Uh, that's an excellent point. So um, we thought those might be uh, uh, something you might want to take account of, and that's in the code, and uh, okay. I'll give you some sense for that. It's the actual effect ends up being surprisingly small, but that wasn't at all clear to us from the order of magnitude calculation. So again, from uh, Jens' 2006 paper, here's the difference between the resolved L and unresolved L case. And so we see uh, exactly as, as I was saying on the previous plot, on the pre previous slide, uh, we get bottlenecked in these highly excited states. And so we don't recombine as efficiently uh, when we separate these different angular momentum states. And so we see that at late times, we have more free electrons because the recombination process hasn't been very efficient. So what's the tool that we bring to bear on this problem? Well, we implement a multi-level atom calculation. So we're just keeping track of all the bound-bound rates uh, between different bound-bound states. Um, and we also keep track of all the recombination and photoionization processes, uh, including stimulated emission, which surprisingly matters sometimes. Um, and then finally, in this paper, we've just included the 2s to 1s2 photon transition. Chris has done some very nice work, in, and I think you've, have, did you guys do a paper on, on this one too, the very highly excited states or? Uh, the two photon rates. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, people have worked out the effect of uh, two photon decays from very highly excited states. So here we've restricted ourselves to this strongest bottleneck and we just want to explore the effect of convergence as you add these very highly excited states. So the free electron fraction is just evolved by this equation that the, free, uh, the, free, the time derivative of the free electron fraction is minus the time derivative of the population of ground state hydrogen. And there's two contributions here. One is this escape channel through the two photon to one photon decay. And this uh, second term here is just due to um, the reverse rate, absorbing two photons and exciting a hydrogen atom from the ground state to the 2s excited state. And then this term tells us um, how efficiently we get to the ground state uh, using Lyman series uh, transitions. So of course this depends on the relevant Einstein coefficients but as I mentioned, there are these bottlenecks uh, due to these resonances, but there's some escape probability due to the expansion of the universe. So that lives in this Sobolev escape probability. And then we have a bunch of phase space factors you don't need to know about, uh, or if you do need to know about them, you know about them. Um, and then so this, the overall physical effect of this term is this is just telling us about the overall current to the ground state uh, due to the Lyman series of transitions. So. How do we treat this escape probability? Uh, there's this very nice expression for the probability of escape off resonance. It's just the Sobolev approximation. And this depends on the Sobolev optical depth. And so there's a few things that matter here. One is the density of resonant absorbers, basically how many targets we have for our photons. And this is the Einstein coefficient. So this is the sort of the overall rate, how efficiently we're absorbing and that's a rate, and we're comparing that to the expansion rate of the universe. So this tells us how efficiently we're escaping off resonance. So the REC sparse core code can also uh, include uh, radiative, radiative feedback, uh, 
that's a complication to the problem that slows things down. So here we're just considering the no feedback case uh, and including the effect of these uh, very highly excited states. And a large fraction of the, of the literature uh, in the last year or two on recombination has been on helium or on corrections to radiative transfer. Um, so here we're focusing on the effect of these very highly excited states. But there's a whole zoo of other things uh, that are, have been shown to be important at various levels of statistical significance. Uh, one is deviations from the steady state approximation uh, in the radiative transfer equation. Um, most people just assume purely incoherent scattering. There's a correction from coherent scattering, a correction from atomic recoil, diffusion near resonance lines, line overlap between the highly excited Lyman series, feedback from hydrogen and helium, higher end to photon processes in hydrogen and helium, deuterium recombination, uh, which uh, Jens and Jeffrey are working on, and additional effects, uh, a whole slew of more subtle things uh, in helium. So just to give you some sense for the, the size of the problem. But the evolution equations uh, that we would sort of a priori have to solve for the excited states can just be written as uh, a matrix rate equation and I want to emphasize the point that um, we've left the ground state out of this vector, and there's a reason for that. That is part of the way we make the problem computationally tractable. And so this uh, population vector just contains the populations of all the different angular momentum substates of the hydrogen atom. So all the n for a given L live inside this guy. And the rate matrix um, is block tridiagonal, and that's not just a computational statement. There's physics there. Uh, so the point is that these diagonal blocks contain all the bound-bound transitions out of some state uh, X, uh, photoionization, and two photon transitions to the ground state. And the off-diagonal blocks just tell us how all the other states feed back into this. And the block tridiagonal structure, this matrix, is just a function of the fact that we have this electric dipole selection rule. So this matrix is sparse, and that's why the problem is much smaller than you would naively think. And then finally, because we've left the ground state out of this vector here, uh, anything that depends on ground state populations, we shove into this source vector um, or on continuum populations. So that's the, uh, that includes rec direct recombination to some state L and one and two photon transitions from the ground state. So one of the key simplifications uh, that makes this problem much easier to solve than you would naively think is that the rates on this uh, side of the problem are really fast. Uh, much faster, in fact, than the cosmological rate on this left-hand side of the problem, as long as we're leaving the ground state out of this x here. So that's why we do that. And so the point is that the left-hand side of this equation is much uh, less than the right-hand side of this equation. So we're able to take what would be a, a set of thousands of stiff coupled ODEs and solve it using a linear algebraic approach. We just invert this rate matrix effectively to get the populations of the excited states. And then as far as the time evolution of the problem goes, all we have to do is increment the free electron fraction, the ratio of the relevant temperatures, and then just keep inverting this problem. So that makes uh, the problem considerably easier to solve. Um, the relevant rate matrix is of order n max squared on a side. So naively, uh, because matrix inversion is a side length cubed process, unless you have some sort of symmetry to help you, and the side is n max squared, the overall scaling of the problem would naively be something like uh, uh, n max to the sixth. And just running some numbers, you can show that, you know, at least for the computer I have at my desk, it would take 10 to the 5 seconds to do a singular, single inversion for n max of 200. And you can imagine that we have to do hundreds of inversions in order to generate a complete recombination history. So, but as I mentioned, um, the sparseness of this matrix is what saves the day. Um, so we have this block tridiagonal form uh, that we'd like to invert. And so we can rewrite the problem. These M's are just the different blocks, like so. And so this just tells us that some state L just talks to its neighbors in angular momentum space with some source vector. So we can solve the problem in closed form, basically. We can work out the population of this guy after a whole bunch of matrix multiplication, and then feed things back in iteratively to get the whole chain of um, populations of excited, highly excited states of hydrogen. So a few minor notes here. Um, we are still imposing some sort of truncation, some sort of cutoff in our hierarchy. Um, in other words, uh, we can think about this as setting the Einstein coefficient to states with n greater than n max uh, equal to zero. 
So that's something you know, that we'd like to get a handle on eventually, is to figure out what is the error from all the states we're leaving out of the problem. Uh, to move from sort of the question of absolute convergence of the recombination, from the question of relative convergence to absolute convergence of the recombination history. But the nice thing is that the scaling of the problem now with, the, with this new code empirically seems to be something like n max to the 2.5. So we're able to run uh, the case of n max of 100 in less than a day instead of uh, six days or, or four days, something like that. And the n max of 200 case, uh, which people weren't able to calculate in this L splitting case, can now be run in four days. And in fact, we can even do the n of 300 case. Uh, that uh, takes two weeks, and I haven't put that in these plots yet. But we've gone up to n max of 250. So, uh, so that's the high end problem. Um, I'm sort of going to go through methods and then results. And so the other um, sort of thing you might want to do is include a variety of forbidden transitions in the problem. And so one forbidden transition is these uh, higher end two photon transitions in hydrogen, which are in, well, okay, you might see the number five sigma floating around in some places, but they're very important for Planck data analysis. They move the likelihood peak over by a, by a whole bunch. And uh, forbidden transitions in helium are also important. Uh, intercombination lines, uh, quadrupole transitions in, in, in helium. And one thing uh, that no one had, had bothered checking yet is if um, there are other forbidden transitions in hydrogen which change the recombination problem. And in particular, the one we're interested in uh, uh, is these electric quadrupole or the E2 transitions. Um, the magnetic dipole transitions are suppressed by, I think, two or three orders of magnitude relative to these guys. So we wanted, I mean, it was on our list, right? If the E2 transitions are important, it, it would be sensible to check the M1 transitions as well. Um, as you'll see in a little bit, they, these end up being irrelevant, so we, we sort of closed the book on that. But the, um, why would you consider these transitions, which, you know, okay, they're suppressed by a factor of alpha, you might think they're irrelevant. Um, but the escape probabilities for these relevant um, for these for the resonant escape probabilities in the Sabalev pro approximation scale like so. So for any optically thick limit, we can forget about this little exponential. And so the, the escape rate, the effective rate, goes as the Einstein coefficient over the optical depth uh, once we saturate lines. But the optical depth itself goes as the Einstein coefficient. So it sort of seems that once we start looking at a, at a whole bunch of different saturated lines, uh, you know, quadrupole transitions could at least conceivably be as important as, as dipole transitions. That ends up not being the case, but that was the motivation for considering them. Um, so quadrupole transitions have the selection rule of delta L equals plus or minus two, and our whole inversion scheme sort of hinged on having delta L equals plus or minus one. Um, so we, you know, it's, it would have been easy enough to generalize, but just as a first pass, we decided to ask the question if if there's a series of those rates that's uh, much faster than another. And it turns out there is. The quadrupole rate to the ground state is much greater, uh, things scale as the frequency to the fifth power, than the rate to excited states. And even if we're comparing with the quadrupole transition rate from other states uh, to m equals two with the, the rate to the ground state, uh, we have a ratio of over a thousand. So because um, because we can, only, we can at least, that as a first pass, restrict ourselves to the ground state quadrupole transitions that lets us solve the problem uh, with very little modification to our machinery. And what's going on here is just that we have, uh, in addition to the quadrupole lines being optically thick, the Lyman lines are optically thick. So an ND to 1S transition is immediately followed by a 1S to NP transition. So you can essentially treat this as a current from D to P states um, that's proportional to the relevant uh, ground state Einstein rate multiplied by the uh, fraction of atoms in the ND state. And so the nice thing about approaching the problem this way is it lets us keep the same sparsity pattern and use the same machinery to include this effect. And of course we could also have the reverse process starting in a P state going to a D state. So this is the overall quadrupole transition rate. So we have a forward and a backward rate and this five thirds is just one of your usual detailed balance um, factors that comes from ratios of the degeneracy of the PND states. So that's the machinery. Um, now I'm going to tell you about the results of our calculation. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the state of the gas, um, how bad the deviations from equilibrium are, and then I'll cut to the chase with the free electron fraction and the microwave background multiple moments. So here I've shown 
uh, deviations from the Boltzmann equilibrium case of the statistical equilibrium case between different L for a 140 shell calculation uh, for the 25th and 140th shells at three different redshifts. So there are a few things you can take away from this. Uh, the first is that these lower L states, because they're not as bottlenecked, they can easily cascade down, and so they're relatively underpopulated. But the L equals zero, right, state is a little bit pinched because you can't go to lower L than L equals zero. So these aren't quite as underpopulated. And then finally, you have these higher L, and these are really bottlenecked by this delta L equals plus or minus one rule. Once you get to high enough L, even though you're stuck, you're not uh, cascading to the ground state efficiently, we're not feeding these states as efficiently either. Uh, the recombination rate falls off with L fairly dramatically. Um, and so that is why things dip back down here. But their overall trend here is that as we go to later and later times, we're more and more out of statistical equilibrium. But the one thing we did want to convince ourselves of uh, to make sure there wasn't some sort of numerical artifact uh, is, you know, who ordered that? Uh, where did that... This is going awfully slowly. Why is it? Uh-oh. The timer just stopped... Uh, Oh, goodness. I think, oh, wait, here we go. Yeah, so the question is why we have this feature at L equals 2. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So the question here is where this dip comes from. And the hypothesis is just that the, the Balmer transitions from the D state, if you actually look at the atomic rate coefficients, are faster than the P or the S transition rates. So we just wanted to see if we could move the dip over by turning off the Balmer series. And indeed, when you turn off the L equals 2 Balmer lines, the dip moves from L equals 2 to L equals 1. So that feature is, is physical. It's not, it's not spurious. Um, one caveat I do want to bring up on that plot, though, is that it doesn't include the effect of collisional transitions, L changing collisions between the different states. And so, um, as Jens pointed out in uh, his 2006 paper, collisions actually push you back in the other direction. They bring you much closer to statistical equilibrium. I think that uh, in most cases, this ends up being pretty important for the spectrum of the radiation, radiation but not as important. It doesn't have as big of an effect on the free electron fraction. But that's definitely a part of the problem that is not under the best control. And, you know, if someone should uh, go calculate these collision rates theoretically, they're actually <coughs> unknown to factors of two. Um, a lot of people worked on these rates uh, when they were trying to predict spectra from inter interstellar um, emission regions in the 70s, and then everyone sort of threw their hands up in the air collectively and stopped working on it. And I think it would be really nice if someone uh, worked out those rates uh, once and for all. Uh, otherwise, I'll try to do it. Um, what's the difficulty there? Is it the fact that the cost that came from the waveform? Yeah, it, the, the thing that gets hard is that the, um, the, the, the impact parameter, the passing electron, puts you inside the atom. And so it becomes a three-body quantum mechanical problem. So it's not totally intractable, but sort of the usual methods people use to work out collision rates don't work as well in this regime for the plasma density and temperature. But in, in principle, you should be able to go calculate it. It's just messy. That's the electron um, needs for collision rate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, uh, the proton rates are, 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 are less important because uh, the, velo the velocities are just so much smaller. But the plot you just showed indicated that First approximation cushions are essential. Well, or is that not always true? They're essential. They're most essential in the highly excited states that are a small fraction of the sort of the recombination cascade. So if you want to get a spectrum, yeah, you'll be you'll be pretty far off, I think, if you leave the collisions out. But if you just want a free electron fraction out of the problem, you won't be doing as badly. But that's that's somewhat of an open question, right? One, so one one important reason is because 
collisions are actually important at high redshifts, where the densities are larger. But at high redshifts, things are not really bottlenecked yet by recombination rates to high, like high levels. That's one aspect of it. So when you go to lower redshifts, uh, this is at 1,200, which is still in the regime where things are not really bottlenecked by high levels. You could do a three or 10 shell calculation and still get the right electron function. But if you go to lower redshifts, then the collision rates become less dominant and the curves are actually coinciding more. Even the high states, okay, they are still different, but you know the dynamics is not really so much influenced by these collisions. And in fact, also, most of the spectral distortions are not complete and not very strongly affected. Is if it you would push the collision rates by a factor of one million, you would get the solution which is statistical equilibrium among all the sublevels. And then you get a completely different spectrum than you, you get in the case where you don't do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's absolutely right. One should really compute these collision rates, not only L changing collision rates, because you can also go jump uh, delta L plus minus two, three, and so on. But then also the ionization rates and all this stuff is this very uncertain. One should really do that. And that's one of the things which we always try to motivate atomic physicists somehow to, to go in a bit. But uh, I agree. Yeah. Then it's not doing it uh, or nobody else. Well, someone has so to do it. I will also do it yeah. Um, but we can also start to compare things. We can not only ask about the populations of different angular momentum substates, but how bad the non-equilibrium problem is for different shells. And so here, the, the sort of overall lesson is, is more or less the same. At low, at high redshift, everything's very close to equilibrium uh, with in every very close to Boltzmann equilibrium with n equals two state. As, at late times, we get you know, several orders of magnitude out of Boltzmann equilibrium, but these curves flatten out, and that's just because the, the, different states, the different states are getting closer and closer to each other as we go to high end. One thing I want to emphasize, because sometimes people get a little bit led astray by this plot, this isn't population inversion in and of itself. It's just saying we're overexcited relative to Boltzmann equilibrium, but we still have fewer, fewer atoms in a highly excited state than in a, in a less excited state. But one thing that we see in our code, at least in this purely radiative case that we've solved, is between some of the highly excited states, between six, N of 60 and 100, we are seeing some hints of, of mild population inversion. Now, this could go away when we do the collisional part of the problem, right? But I think it would be very exciting if we could actually have amazing, you know, a laser pointed at us from, from the epic of, of, of recombination. Even if the population inversion doesn't go away, there's the question of if this radiation actually stays ho coherent and gets amplified along the line of sight. So, so that's a big if, but just think about how exciting it would be if we could take this one part in 10 to the seventh uh, distortion and coherently amplify it to somewhere where it's actually comparable to the CMBN isotropies we've ever already seen. In that case, to find it, you know, we just have to sort of scan in frequency space with a very good uh, uh, spectrometer instead of scanning across the sky. We just observe the whole sky or some particularly clean patch. I, I'm a bit pessimistic in that case in some sense because I know that uh, the lowest frequency parts, they are coming from excitations. If you just cut, cut, uh, count the peak, Oh, I see. Yeah, so this so is a... 13, 14, yeah, 15 yeah. shell, maybe at 1 right. gigahertz. Right. right. 40 is shell will be, you know, way down and free, free absorption is actually killing everything. Uh, much less below 100 megahertz. Okay, so, so that's free absorption is just bringing you, yeah. you know, eating you. So I, I'm, I, I mean, when we pushed it to 100 shells, our main goal was to see how is the low frequency scaling going, and uh, is there actually something that stimulates emission becoming really important? Because at low frequencies, you have uh, the phase space density by the black body emitting radiation field becoming very strong, and you really have stimulated effects. But it turned out not to be anything in this direction. And, and then we also checked trying to push it with no L splitting to, to even less lower frequencies. And there we checked as well the, um, the free free. And, that and so, and so, so it's basically the opacity that, that eats it? Yeah. Okay. I think, I think it would eat it. So, yeah. But it's, it's nevertheless, it's very interesting to check that. Um, and the other thing we can consider is uh, deviations from Saha equilibrium. And so again, lesson is we get worse and worse at late times. In the case of Saha equilibrium, we get closer and closer to the continuum at high end, and so we start converging towards Saha equilibrium. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this plot is that if we're trying to get some handle on our absolute error as opposed to our relative error, 
uh, we could hope to populate the high, seeing, looking at this plot, you might hope to populate the highest excited states uh, in Saha equilibrium and use asymptotic scalings for the Einstein coefficient, you know, have some sort of fit coefficient that you feed back into your hierarchy. Unfortunately, it seems that we don't really get to a reasonable deviation from Saha equilibrium at the lowest redshifts until an n max of 1,000. But that's in the purely radiative case. So if we're able to get a handle on these collisional rates, it's at least conceivable that we'll then have a turnover to Saha at, say, n max of 200. And then we could really move from the, the question of convergence we've been exploring already, which is relative convergence, to the question of absolute convergence. So enough about the state of the gas. Uh, now let's talk about the uh, effect on the free electron fraction. And so on the left here, I've shown the relative correction between uh, higher and higher Nmax levels as generated by this rec sparse code. And we've more or less uh, doubled the Nmax with each increment here. Um, the free electron fraction gets smaller and smaller with higher Nmax. And the reason is just that we have this hierarchy of rates. The recombination rate is greater than the overall bound bound rate, which is greater than the overall ionization and upward bound bound rate. So by adding more levels, we're just producing you know, a, a larger number of pathways to the ground state. And so the free electron fraction shrinks. And another nice thing is that as we go to higher and higher Nmax, the correction shrinks. Um, and so we're hopeful, right, that we're seeing some kind of convergence here. The other thing uh, that's important to, to grab from this plot is that at the highest redshifts, the effect of these very high states is pretty small. And it's only here, around this turnover, that we really start to make a huge difference. And so if you're trying to build some intuition for the effect on CMB anisotropies, you can start to guess that it's basically going to be the optical depth due to rescattering the primary anisotropies um, that'll cause the change. But you know, I do want to stress that these are, in some sense, lower limits to the actual error because uh, we haven't explored the question of absolute convergence as opposed to uh, relative convergence. I guess when I made the slide, n max of 300 hadn't completed yet, but uh, that's done. So that's the effect from these highly excited states. The next uh, question we can ask is about the effect of electric quadrupole transitions. And so here, uh, we've shown the free electron fraction without the quadrupoles as opposed to with them. And so, again, these guys speed up uh, recombination, and that's just because they give, a w they give us a way for the different L states to talk to each other and for us to find our way to the ground state more efficiently. So the overall uh, effect here is just that as we add quadrupole transitions, uh, we speed up recombination a little bit, um, particularly at early times. And uh, the reason uh, that things work that way is that if you look at this overall rate due to quadrupole transitions, it always wants to push you towards equilibrium. So it turns out that at, for n states of n less than 5 at the earliest times, the overpopulation is in the d direction relative to p. So this rate is going to give us a flow of atoms from the d states to the p states. Those guys are going to decay uh, via Balmer transitions to the 2s state. And at the earliest of times, this 2s to 1s two photon rate is the dominant recombination channel. So by funneling things essentially from, you know, they would have been here and now they're here, so we're speeding up recombination. And so that tells you sort of the overall sign of these curves. Then once we look at n greater than 5 for these early times, the uh, overpopulation turns out to be in the other direction. So we flow from the p states to the d states, which find their way to the 2p state. And this is a subdominant recombination channel at the earliest times. So this slows you down relative to what you would have had by leaving out these highly excited states in the quadrupole case. So that's why things um, start out with an enhancement in recombination, and then that gets less and less dramatic as we um, include highly excited states at early times. At the latest times, the overpopulation ratio for all n is in this direction. So we flow from uh, L equal from L equals 1 states to L equals 2 states and down to this 2p state. But then again, at late times, this escape off Lyman alpha resonance is the dominant recombination mode. So this speeds up recombination. And so that's why as we go to higher n max, um, recombination becomes more and more efficient. But of course, you know, now that I've described the shape of this curve ad nauseum, uh, really what's going on here is the free electron fraction, the change in the free electron fraction due to the inclusion of these quadrupole transitions is uh, something like one part in 10 to the 5. 
So it's still worth checking, but you can already guess that this is basically going to be, this effect, unlike the highly excited states, is going to be totally negligible for Planck data analysis. But at the end of 100, the radius of your orbit becomes like a micron. Or yeah, yeah. And then your quantum pole becomes the same size as your dipole. For, for the pole, let's say 100p to 1s transition, at least. Right, 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 right. So. This becomes an all unity effect. If, if you say end of 100 is important, then... Oh, you're the saying then the quadrupoles would naively be... Yeah, Well, I mean, the overall effect is still... I mean, things do seem to converge as you go to high N. The, right here, we see that at Nmax, things, things are asymptoting to, to one correction there. And I think, I think the reason things are smaller than you might otherwise think is that all these quadrupole transitions overlap with the Lyman series perfectly. And the Lyman series is actually going to eat all those quadrupole photons. So, I mean, it's the same sort of thing. We thought the effect could be big when we put it in the calculation, but because of this perfect line over, you know, right, if we had two lines, you know, like uh, deuterium Lyman alpha and hydrogen Lyman alpha, and they're offset by some amount, there you could see things being important for two, you know, unequally saturated but still saturated transitions. But in this case, they're sitting right on top of each other. So I think, I think that's why it doesn't matter. So the next thing we did is we took the free electron fraction, these uh, CMB, uh, these, these recombination histories, and we wanted to see what the effect on microwave background anisotropies was. So we just took our favorite Boltzmann code, which is CMB fast, and we took our uh, recombination histories and pasted them in instead of the usual uh, recombination history from CMB fast. And you know our code only runs from a redshift of um, you know 1550 because we're just treating hydrogen and everything's in perfect Saha equilibrium at least for hydrogen at earlier times so we glue it on smoothly to the rec fast output and then at early times we do the same sort of thing and then we start comparing the temperature temperature and isotropies in the different nmax cases uh, with one another and so there are a few things going on here uh, the first thing that you should notice is that at the lowest at the largest angular scales or the lowest l these different recombination histories uh, are indistinguishable. And the reason is that these are scales that are super, uh, super horizon at the surface of last scattering. They're acausal scales, and so, I mean, of course, everything shows up in the line of sight integral, but at least from a sort of heuristic point of view, these are going to be almost irrelevant uh, at low L. But as we go to higher and higher L, um, what happens is that as we add N, the lower free electron fraction at late times drives down the optical depth. And this, in turn, enhances the CMB anisotropies. And so this correction is positive, but again, as we go to higher and higher N, we're seeing um, a smaller and smaller correction. Now, it looks from this plot like we're, still in, like we're still in trouble, like the correction at an Nmax of 250 is still comparable to this sort of overall average sample variance from Planck. That's essentially, if you take the whole Planck sample, assume cosmic variance error bars at each L, and then ask how well on average you want to predict all the C sub Ls if you sum over the whole sample. But this doesn't tell the whole story, of course, because in reality you have noise, and so um, we're going to be OK. Um, we can play the same game with the E-mode polarization anisotropies. And in this case, um, because we're rescattering uh, primary anisotropies, we no longer have this vanishing of the differences between the curves at, at low L, because this is no longer coming from a, a super horizon perturbation in the actual uh, density field. And again, um, you know, polarization is messier, right? Because as I mentioned in the earlier plots, the, the width of the surface of last scattering, at least in principle, is crucial uh, towards setting the amplitude of the polarization. So if we sped recombination up, we'd make that surface thinner, and that would lower the level of polarization. Um, but because the change in the free electron fraction that we're considering is a late time effect, that's essentially irrelevant for the bulk of the vis CMB visibility function. So what happens is, just like with the temperature anisotropies, the polarization anisotropies get rescattered by free electrons on the line of sight, and so the trend is exactly the same. The next question we could ask, of course, uh, just to be safe, is whether the quadrupole anisotropies, you know, we saw that the change in the free electron fraction was at most one part in 10 to the 5, but that stretched over a fairly thick plateau in redshift, so we wanted to be sure that that doesn't uh, 
cause any uh, observable differences in the CMB, uh, multi in the CMB uh, anisotropy multiple moments. So here we've done the same sort of thing with the quadrupoles, comparing the C sub Ls with and without the quadrupole transitions. And we see, first of all, that things converge with Nmax really quickly in this case. And second of all, that the overall perturbation to the CMB uh, anisotropies is less than a few parts in 10 to the 6. So it's undetectable, but marginally so. So I think the calculation was worth doing. In this case, for the quadrupole case, um, again, adding more shells lowers your free electron fraction, which lowers your optical depth and drives up um, your C sub Ls. But of course, uh, we're at best uh, going to be cosmic variance limited uh, with Planck or any future CMB experiment. So you can basically forget about these quadrupole transitions. So, so E is a factor of two, right? Uh, let's see, one second. Yeah. So for EE, e, they're, uh, they're a little bit more important, uh, but it's still, you know, uh, several parts in 10 to the sixth. And so again, uh, remember that you can forget about them, basically. So the next sort of thing uh, we can do is we can really start to ask how quickly things converge with Nmax. And so here, just at a few redshifts, we've plotted the difference in the recombination histories as a function of Nmax. And so, you know, we have some sort of turnover here, but at the highest end, you know, I can put a ruler through these lines. I don't know how convinced you are, but the, um, the relative error between different Nmax turns out to scale very nicely uh, as something like Nmax to the minus 1.9. So if the true error is described by a power law with the same index, there's a one-to-one -one mapping from the relative error to the absolute error. And so we can actually extrapolate to guesstimate the absolute error left in the recombination history. Of course, that won't really be an, an ironclad statement until we have this sort of source term for states past our cutoff and have some sort of scheme involving collisions and, and Saha equilibrium populations at the highest states to close the book there finally. So there are a lot of ways you can explore uh, the effect of this physics on uh, CMB uh, data analysis. Uh, one thing you could think about is this so-called Z statistic, uh, which measures, at least in principle, how many sigma, uh, how, how many sigma your whole likelihood function is going to move over when you uh, include some effect as opposed to neglect it. So what you do is you, um, these delta C sub Ls are the changes in the CMB power spectra due to the physics we've included here. And the sums over X and Y are just sums over the different power spectra in the problem. So there's, T, there's the TT correlation, TE, EE, EB, TB. Um, in this case, we've summed, uh, just included temperature and, and E-mode polarization anisotropies. And then we sum over all the L and L prime. And then this beast here, F, uh, L, L prime, is the covariance matrix of, of the data. So for some fiducial set of cosmological parameters, there's cosmic variance noise sitting in here, but there's also um, some estimate of the uh, error, actual realistic error bars from Planck. In this case, we've just used numbers from the Planck. Is, I can never remember if it's the blue book or the black book, but uh, we're from the Planck uh, blue book. And so we can get an estimate, you know, if we extrapolate, you know, uh, to our total error for some Nmax, we can ask how far the likelihood peak um, moves over for, uh, for a given Nmax value. So for an Nmax value of 64, we move over something like 1.8 sigma. At an Nmax of 128, we move over less than half a sigma, so we're, we're pretty much totally converged. But if you play the game up to Nmax of 50, the inclusion of um, highly excited states is going to move your likelihood peak uh, over to 0 0.14. But as you already saw, the overall effect of these highly excited states was just the amplitude of, of, of the effect at the highest L. So you can already imagine that the um, A sub S, right, the amplitude of the power spectrum is going to be the dominant degeneracy there. But of course, we're not going to measure that perfectly from the CMB on its own because the amplitude of the power spectrum is degenerate with the optical depth at these scales. So even though this likelihood peak moves over uh, something like two sigma from this estimate, it's only when you start combining the CMB with other data sets to break the degeneracy between the power spectrum and the optical depth that you're actually going to start to have to worry about the effect of these really highly excited states. So to wrap up, um, we have a new tool, uh, RecSparse, uh, which will quickly calculate recombination histories 
uh, in the pure hydrogen, purely radiative case, uh, but including all these different transitions. And we've shown that um, highly excited states, at least if you trust the Z statistic uh, and the extrapolation I mentioned, are going to be relevant for CMB data analysis, but these electric quadrupole transitions uh, can be safely forgotten. And uh, just to uh, give you some sense of where I'd like to take this problem in the next few months, um, one of the students in our research group, uh, Yasin Ali Haimoud, has developed a really nice uh, formalism correcting the Sabalev approximation for the effect of overlapping states at high n. And so one thing that should be fairly straightforward to do is to take this very elegant formalism he's developed and to put it in our code instead of the Sabalev probabilities to see if that causes um, an observable change in the microwave background multiple moments. The other big to do, and, and this is sort of the thing I'm, I'm most <laughs> eager and, and also most nervous about, is um, it, in developing a cutoff method for these levels we've excluded. So putting things in Saha equilibrium um, and then hoping that the collisional rates will, will bring us into a regime where we can uh, honestly do that. Um, another thing that would be good to do would uh, to start doing Monte Carlo uh, analyses uh, with different permutations of combined data sets instead of just using the Z statistic. And finally, um, to sort of go check for ourselves if, uh, if these cosmological masers are indeed eaten up by, uh, by the opacity. So uh, I'll stop there. It's a big effect. It's a big effect. I mean, the accurate treatment of helium is, uh, what is it? It's like a percent between RegFast and the, yeah. the recent correction. It's, so that's. It's a 3% correction at helium recombination. How many are also included? Helium, um, the helium calculations include um, up to N of 100 at this point. The tricky thing with helium, but I think it's okay because helium is 1% of all the, re all the free electrons. The tricky thing with helium is that you know, it has these pesky two electrons. And so you can't just solve all the rates in closed form. Um, but um, people have done that in the WKB approximation. And I think that's under pretty good control. Well, the spectrum helium, helium atomic physics should be done properly. So. But uh, helium is not, I mean, it's really like basically a factor of 10 less important than hydrogen. You can, if you have a 3% correction, it will propagate to an open 3% correction in the, you know. So with respect to hydrogen recombination, the speed up due to line diffusion and so on is much more important. It's, it's at the level which is probably um, in the way they quantify the, the, the F statistics, probably still two, three times, maybe four times more important. Right. And uh, I think it'll be a small perturbation, but um, it's something I really want to convince myself of. I mean, the, qualitatively, you saw they're going to flatten out those deviations from from equilibrium, um, and you know, as as Yen said, it's it's at early times that the problem is sort of that the collisions are most efficient. So I think it'll be small correction, but it's something I want to convince myself of. Okay, so then see you on Monday and let's go upstairs and have a